today our speaker is manjit singh puji and it's man- this, manpreet yeah manpreet manpreet singh puji and he is senior faculty 3d animation at inish edugun solutions private limited he did his bfa bachelor of fine arts from university of colorado denver he is working in this industry since the last 7 uh, years plus he was a 3d generalist and advanced content experience with february august 2019 to march 2020 he was technical director of productions uh, rigging and compositing from august 2018 to may 2019 he was virtual reality research assistant from february 2018 to may 2019 he was also autodex maya expert from expert from january 2018 to may 2019 So today, actually, uh, we we will start the uh, industry talk about the digital scapulating, and uh, welcome to sir, and you can start the sessions. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Suman. Yeah. So, uh, I guess everyone has already gotten the introduction for me. So my name is Manpreet Singh Puji, and you know I've been in this industry for a little bit of time, and I also studied. 3D animation from the US itself at the University of Colorado Denver. So you know the experience I've usually gotten is mostly with movies and animation, but I've also kind of like drove myself towards the field of visual effects or you could say advertisements and you know a variety of fields as well as you know biomedical research that was one of the jobs i used to have was to do research using animations so you know animation in itself it can be utilized for many different kinds of works and you know i believe animation has evolved to such an extent where it's very much tough to kind of distinguish between what's real and what's not so i believe this field has become very important nowadays as well as you know in the near future it's going to be utilized in a lot more than what we see so you know my topic for today is digital sculpting so sculpting is a process which you know digital sculpting has been evolved from the traditional method of sculpting so if you guys are familiar with a lot of sculptures especially you know in the old ages from the roman empire or the greek times you know there's a lot of history where we have seen a lot of sculptures created a lot of research done about how you know form of a object is made how different materials are used how you know different tools are utilized to make something and the same way digital sculpting also offers us these the method is a little bit different but the fundamentals are very much the same as what the traditional methods of sculpting offer and you know in digital sculpting nowadays we use it for you know a lot of digital mediums like movies or you know games and things have become more complicated and more realistic as time goes on and if you be nowadays in any kind of media sculpting is a part which allows you to create very realistic characters as well as anything like creatures or you know if you want to make something that's more organic sculpting is something that kind of allows you to create that so that's what we will kind of dive in to would be the basics of what you know how sculpting is done as well as how which tools are utilized as well as the more technical factors of how you can utilize those sculpts how you can convert it into something that is more usable as well as how you know you can make it more efficient to whatever you're trying to achieve so you know during this time if anyone has any questions feel free to ask you know you can either speak or you can just type it in the chat and i can look into it and you know i can try to help you other than that you know i also want to 
kind of ask you guys, uh, is anyone who is very familiar to scalping or you know, has very good experience with scalping here? Yes, I had little uh, completed some assignment uh, of uh, digital scalping for mm -hmm. movie like Sucker Punch, World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. some is only. That's nice. Uh, which software did you use for that? Uh, commonly, in a long time back, we were using Silo application, but now it has been mm -hmm. upgraded to Mudbox and ZBrush itself. Yeah. So mostly the one I use is also ZBrush. Uh, ZBrush is very much the standard of sculpting nowadays. It's widely used in almost every, you know, every scenario where sculpting is required. So anyone else who has any experience in sculpting? Uh, I don't have uh, experience in digital sculpting, but uh, in my college mm -hmm. life and after that few years, I worked in normal clay modeling and all. So I don't have any digital experience. Yeah, that's also pretty good. I mean, you know, the foundation, the fundamentals that traditional sculpting methods like clay sculpting has very much transfer over to digital sculpting. So that's you know, having that experience also helps. So I also kind of ha had some sculpting, you know, clay sculpting classes, which helped me learn how to sculpt digitally. You know, I do understand the tools are a little bit different, but the fundamentals are very much the same. So that's pretty good. So anyone else who also has, you know, any experience in clay sculpting as well um, as, or, you know, digital sculpting? I'm, I'm, I, am, uh, I have been trained as a sculptor, uh, both okay. my bachelor's and master's. Mm -hmm. Clay, stone, bronze, iron, concrete, uh, all these materials and experimental materials. But digital sculpting, I, I do not know so far. Okay. That's I do not have really experience nice. in digital sculpting. Yeah. I think this session will, you know, kind of give everyone a really good idea of what digital sculpting is. You know, there is the thing about animation, specifically 3D animation, is that it's a blend between technical and artistic aspects. So, you know, the artistic side is something which I believe, you know, everyone learns from using different mediums and it very much is common. So, you know, a person who understands art can easily understand how to make something, you know, how to basically create something. And the technical side is where, you, you know, one needs to understand how to utilize the tools how to use all these mediums to create something. So 3D is very much that, you know, with drawing, you know, one can have an imagination of what to draw, but they should also have, you know, they will have, also have to learn how to utilize the pencil or to, you know, use like a color pen or something. So those tools is very much like the technical side of making something and those that imagination and you know the ability to create something is the artistic side so anyone else who you know would like to express their you know thought about sculpting or you know if they have any experience in sculpting All right, I also want to ask uh, anyone who has any experience in 3D animation, you know, just modeling or, you know, maybe game designing. Oh, Sorry, what's that? Yeah, someone here. Yeah. Ravagar, sir, can you give the answers? I think he's asking you for game designs. Sorry? Hello. Sorry, I was just wondering if, you know, if anyone here has experience in game designing or, you know, just 3D modeling. 
Yeah, I have experience in game design and uh, game development. Okay, that's and nice. So yeah, uh, so basically another side of sculpting, you know, where we, you know, we can sculpt anything that we want, but, you know, we also have to make sure that it is, you know, efficient enough. So like, especially in game designing, you know, things, you know, there are resources, you have to make sure nothing is very heavy on the game. You know, games usually require a lot of processing power and to make sure it's efficient. So usually the lower the detail, the efficient it is. So, you know, one, an artist has to make sure that they're making something by achieving the most quality out of the most efficient product. And that's also something, you know, I will be discussing about sculpting. So sculpting, you know, when you sculpt something, you try to achieve the most detail that's possible, but that, but then you have to make sure you can easily convert it into a more efficient version, which gives you a similar kind of detail, but has a lot less, you know, doesn't require as much power as you know, the highest version would be. So yes, the low poly version is what is usually required for game designing. And there are many different tricks that you can use to achieve a really good look of an object or any asset. And then you can kind of, you know, you can have it efficient, but you can still kind of get a really, you know, good looking model. So let me actually start by sharing my screen and show you a few examples. So, all right. So let me kind of also show you a little bit of my work before we kind of proceed further. So I'm actually a 3D generalist. I, you know, sculpting is one part of what I do. I actually also, you know, I do hard surface modeling. I do sculpting, texturing, rigging, animation, compositing, dynamics. So almost all aspects of 3D animation. You know, there are, of course, there's more, you know, there's some parts that I'm better than others. So like things like modeling and sculpting, I'm pretty good at. You know, texturing, I might be not as good as someone else who's more professional in it but I still kind of do it. Things like animation rigging is also something that I am pretty proficient at. And dynamics simulations is also something I kind of, you know, I know how to do it, but I wouldn't say I'm, you know, that good enough, you know, compared to any other aspects that I'm, you know, I do. So let me actually show you my portfolio. So uh, can everyone see the screen properly? And is it working fine for everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, you know, I, as a person, I love cars. So I, you know, for hard surface modeling, I usually try creating a lot of cars and, you know, like something which is, you know, cars have really unique shapes and they have, you know, like really, like they're shiny, they're like machines that, you know, that allow you to move, but they have this factor of, you know, design that is added to them. So this design is something that really attracts me. So I usually like modeling cars for hard surfaces, but other than that, you know, I also love making characters. So worked on making a few characters like Deathstroke. Deathstroke is a character from DC Comics. So it's a, you know, Deathstroke is a villain for Batman. So I kind of tried to, you know, make a character out of it. So my challenge was usually to make something that is more organic. So orga by orga uh, you know, organic, I mean, humans, you know, are 
like bodies have, you know, we, we are not like machines, you know, like we don't have any armor on us. We are, you know, our bodies like is a soft surface. It's not like a metal that you would see. So hard surface is very much like things that are more, you know, more man-made. You know, you could say something that is very, you know, accurate in terms of how it's made. Soft surfaces are more unique, you know, things like rocks, even though, you know, if you touch it, it will be hard, but, you know, it's soft surface because, you know, every rock is unique. Not all rocks look the same. In the same way, all humans have unique properties, you know, so they're, that's why they're considered organic shapes. So, you know, this character itself was a challenge for me to put, you know, a human and have that human, you know, have a lot of armor, which is more hard surface. So a blend between organic body and hard surface armor on top. So the same way, you know, I sculpted something like this. And this was, this is a crocodile, which is, you know, sculpted in ZBrush. So this was a challenge to create all this detail in it, you know, have all these scales and all the teeth, you know, all that detail right there. So ZBrush basically allows you to kind of add these kind of details. And, you know, after a lot of practice, I try to create my own self portrait. So the picture on Zoom right now is actually a 3D version. So I liked, you know, when I think someone was mentioning that, you know, it's it's good not to put your own picture. You know, it's easy, you know, easy to kind of take someone's picture. So I think one way to kind of solve it is to have a 3D version of yourself. That way, no one can kind of steal your identity. So this is also something I sculpted in ZBrush. It's you know basically sculpting a face and then adding cloth on top. So this is very much like you know sculpted in 3D. And you know, using different 3D techniques, I also kind of rendered this. Now rendering is a process of kind of simulating realistic lighting on top of a surface and making it look more realistic. And you know, look, looking at the breakdown, you know, this is how it looks. So this is without any extra add-ons. This is what I sculpted. And this is what the underlying you know, shape of the object looks like. So every 3D object is you know, built upon you know, connection of these lines that make up a face. So you know, all of these connect together to create this shape. And quickly look at the chat. Thank you. So uh, subsurface scattering, I think, so there is subsurface scattering. If you look, uh, I can try to zoom in and show you. So at this part right here, you can see there's a little bit of red redness that's happening. Also this part right here. And a little bit of redness right here. So usually subsurface scattering for people who don't know is, you know, our skin usually absorbs light from, you know, any light source. So when light is, you know, being put on your skin, our skin actually absorbs it inside and it kind of glows. So the redness that we usually see in our skin is the blood that is inside and it's kind of glowing because of that light. So without that glow, it's probably going to look very, you know, pale. So that's what subsurface scattering is. So in the chat, the SSS is subsurface scattering. And you know, that's also a lot of things. That's more for texturing thing. So when you're trying to texture something, you know, you're basically adding colors and you're making materials. You're adding these kind of rough bumps to it. 
and you're kind of painting it and making the materials look more realistic. And that's when you have to add, you know, add this feature where it's kind of glowing realistically. So, you know, 3D animation can become really complicated. I'm pretty sure a lot of you already know how it works, but I just want to kind of, you know, reinforce it for people who might miss something. And, you know, after all those things, when you kind of, you know, sculpt something, add the colors, and then you know, using dynamics, you can add hair on top. And then combine it with cloth. You know, you can either sculpt the cloth or you can also kind of simulate this using different softwares. And then you combine all of that together. That's where, when you kind of get something like this right here. So also lights and a camera is needed to make this look more realistic. So without anything like that, it might look like this. And, you know, again, the underlying shape of how it looks like. And this is very much like the efficient version. I mean, I wouldn't say it's the most efficient for any kind of game, but for movie production, efficiency like this could be acceptable. So when I mean efficiency, this is what basically, you know, how many of these lines are building up your shape is what efficiency is. The less these lines are, the more efficient the model is going to be. And yes, the way they're flowing is also matters. So, you know, like in the chat has been mentioned line of flow. So the way the lines are flowing matters a lot. So if they're not flowing the right way, you know, the movement of the face might not look as accurate as something in real life. So muscle flow, you know, again, you know, our eyes, these loops need to be there for the eyes to kind of, you know, move muscles realistically, or, you know, the edge flow is basically you know, the composition of how you're placing these lines together. So now this again is very much like the highest quality version without any color in it. And you can see, you know, there's a lot of these different details that need to be added in it to make it look more realistic. You know, you have to kind of add these details as well as make sure the shape is holding properly. So, you know, like our eyes usually curl inside, you know, when they're open and when they're closed, this part just, you know, uncurls. So, and this is when, you know, I'm trying to add hair on top. This is a little bit different than how this hair is. So I made a little bit adjustments later on, which made, you know, it look more realistic in this one. So, and let's quickly talk about this one. So, this is a character which I created, and you know, I started with very basics of making a you know basic shape of the character. So you can see there's cloth under, and this cloth is you know more organic. It's flowing in a very you know like it's not. I mean cloth itself of course is man-made, but you know the way it's on top of the body is more organic. It it's not you know you can bend it. So, you know, that's why it's kind of considered a soft surface. So I started with sculpting a basic shape with, you know, a face as well as, you know, the overall body, you know, using the arms and the legs. And then I started sculpting more, you know, things on top. So actually I started modeling this armor on top and then so sculpting is a good way to create things that are more random or create things that are supposed to be 
more free flowing. Things like armor, you know, it looks like it has been created, you know, with, you know, this will be similar to this one, but things like cloth or, you know, the way the bed, these unique details, but things like these that are armor is something I modeled in a modeling software. And this is what, you know, the efficient version of this model looks like. I wouldn't say it's completely efficient. Again, you know, I'm more towards, you know, movie making. So things for movies usually are more detailed. Things for games are usually less detailed because, you know, games require a lot of power to run in real time. And, you know, for that, you need even more efficient models. So this is what it looks like from the back. And that's what makes up this shape. And I also have a 3D view that I can show everyone. It's going to load. All right. As you can see, when you have something that's a finished product, which includes the models, the sculpting, you know, you know, the model has been made efficient enough, as well as you know. And then you kind of have a product which looks like this. You know, the the coloring, you know, aka texturing, or you could call it, you know, shading. This process, you know, adds to how an object looks more realistic. Let me see if I can yes, so I used Substance Painter, a software called Substance Painter, which allows you to paint, you know. There's all this difference between how a material looks. Of course, cloth will look like this. You know, it, it, it's, it's not as reflective as something like metal, which you can see right here is very reflective. Then you can see a difference between plastic as well as metal. Metal is shinier and has this really, you know, chrome kind of look. Plastic, on the other hand, also has shininess, which is less, but it's, that feels less heavy in a way. So materials matter, you know, things like skin also right now. I mean, I didn't work much on making the skin as realistic because there's really a small part that you can see, but you know, the difference between skin and anything like metal, you can also kind of, you know, the way you kind of color something matters. So, you know, once you have that coloring, you have a model, but then the next step usually comes in with how you make a model move. So that's where, you know, you kind of have to rig a model. Rigging is very much like attaching controls, you know, very much like a puppet, you know, for a puppet, you have strings that control the puppet for a 3D character, you have these controls that kind of allow you to move that character. So I have this small animation that I created with this character. So let me play it. So as you can see, you know, the character was able to move and you know, the model itself, this is the model with the color in it. This is what the model looks like without any color in it. And this is what the actual structure looks like. So all these lines are connected together to create a model that looks like this. And for creating a movement, 
this is what the breakdown of the rig looks like. You can see there's different kind of lines at different parts. So you can you have the option to kind of select them and move them, you know, according to time. So you know the composition of all these movements together is what allows you to kind of animate this character. You know, I'm pretty sure all of you know how to, you know, how animation works. And you know, in you know, in traditional animation, 2D animation, you know, you kind of go frame by frame. And this is very much similar here. So, you know, according to frames, you place these controls at different parts, which in turn, you know, which control these different body parts of this character. And, you know, a combination of all those movements in different frames is how you can animate something like this. And a lot of times there's a lot of different things, more technical challenges you might have to face when you're making a character. One that I faced was the difference between how, you know, an armor would move versus things like cloth or these belts. So if you can notice, when this moves, the armor needs to kind of push things that are in the way, of course, and make a you know different kind of movement. So you know cloth will kind of deform by deformation I mean you know it will kind of stretch or it will bend. Things like armor doesn't bend, you know it doesn't stretch. So to create something that's more dynamic is what the you know the challenge I had to face in making this. You can see how different movements, things like armor stays and doesn't deform, but things like cloth will deform. So, you know, the process of 3D animation can become very technically challenging, which is why I mentioned that 3D animation is, 3D in general is a blend between art artisticness as well as technical knowledge. So, you know, it requires a lot more to learn in terms of the technicality of how you can achieve things. But then you also need the artistic knowledge to create something that's more unique and, you know, is more appealing to the eye of the public. So, you know, I don't have many examples of sculpting. A lot of them, you know, I I usually practice sculpting in free time. So I just do, you know, I just make something quickly just to, you know, keep my practice, you know, keep my, you know, my knowledge active so that I don't forget anything or, you know, but other than that, you know, I, in terms of products or any portfolio piece that I make, I usually go for, you know, making a full product. So I start with modeling, take it to sculpting, then texture it, then, you know, rig it, then also animate it. You know, I, if it requires dynamics, I also add that. Then lighting, rendering, compositing. So I usually try to create a final product, which includes almost everything that it, you know, requires. So, which is why, you know, I kind of don't focus on one part of this process, but, you know, I still kind of like a few parts like sculpting, you know, that are very much my favorite parts. So let's actually start with, you know, talking about the software that I use for this. So, like some of you said, you know, I think some of you are familiar with ZBrush. So this is the software which I use, it's called ZBrush. And this is very much the industry standard of sculpting. So, you know, any big studios, right? So, you know, if anyone is interested in kind of learning sculpting, 
I would recommend this is the software that you should use. There's also other softwares. One is called Mudbox. Mudbox is also a good software, I would say. It allows you to create something nice, but it doesn't have the kind of you know, feature like, you know, like a thing in, in itself. So it usually allows you to create anything that's sculpt related. You can paint on top. You know, you can convert them into a lower versions. You know, you can do cloth simulations if you want. And the kind of tools this provides is why it's the better software. You know, the brushes that we use, there's plenty of them that you know, allow you to kind of achieve a look very fast, very easily, which is why ZBrush is widely used in the industry. So this also is very different in many ways from other softwares. You know, like a lot of softwares for 3D that we use are, you know, have a very basic system that you can always kind of get used to. ZBrush in itself is kind of different and weird, but once you get used to it, you know, it feels a lot easier than other softwares. Because, you know, in other softwares like Maya, if anyone has used, has all these different menus like file menu, edit menu, you know, all those things. But here, these menus is something, you know, you'll hardly ever use. Like, for example, look at the edit menu, it only has option for undo and redo, nothing else, you know, hardly anything. It does have, you know, a few things, but not much in itself shows you open and save. And it's a weird thing that ZBrush has it, but you know, when you save something from here, it doesn't actually save your project. So the way you actually save it is from here. So from here, you can actually save your model and open it again if you want to. Now, usually with files, you know, other softwares would call them files itself. ZBrush calls it tool which is also confusing to a lot of people. Tool is, you know, basically your sculpt that you create, which kind of doesn't make sense, but ZBrush does it. You know, you can import things from here, you can load things, you, know, you can save things. So this file menu, you don't really never touch it because that's not where you can save anything from. This is the menu which you kind of use to open or save things. Then, let's see. So there's also other, all of these different menus. These are for more advanced things. You might never even need to touch these menus because, you know, again, if you just want to sculpt and nothing else, you will probably never need to touch these menus. But just under this, you will see a lot of other things. So the reason why you don't need to touch them is because most of the things you need are already in front of you. So things like, you know, to move or scale things or take things, you have the buttons right here. Things for coloring. So this is for coloring. You can adjust the intensity, you know, then you can kind of specify how much, you know, does it need to be only on the RGB channel or alpha? I mean, these, this is something we don't need to touch yet. But people who understand what RGB and MRGB is, MRGB is just coloring the material. RGB is just the color itself. Then this is for the brush itself. So how much, you know, intensity it needs to be. So by intensity, I mean, you know, like, if it's real life sculpting and you're using a tool to kind of carve something out of your sculpt, how much strength do you want to put into carving something out? So adding means, you know, very much like adding clay. Subtracting means removing clay. Then draw size is the size of the brush. So if it's this small, if you increase it, it will become this big. 
and focal shift is how smooth it needs to be. If it's less, it's going to be really harsh. If it's more, it's going to be really smooth. So, you know, these are just to control how the brush looks like or, you know, the intensity or the size of the brush. Then to actually change the brush, this is where the menu is. So right now it's not active because we don't have anything in our scene yet. But if we want, you know, let me actually start by making something quickly. So this menu light box is pretty much like it gives you presets to start with. I can probably start with just this demo head for now, or actually let me use this one. So if I double click on it, this will just quickly open. So in this menu right here, you can see it says, if you hover over right here, it says brush. If you click on it, you will see there's different kinds of brushes that you can use to sculpt. So brush is very much like, you know, using a different kind of carving tool or, you know, different ways of adding clay on top of your sculpt. So right now, if I click right here, you can see it's kind of adding sculpt on top of this. And it's adding clay on top of this surface. So let me undo that. And before I proceed further, just give me a second. All right, so I actually have a tablet. So one thing I forgot to mention is sculpting is a process where you kind of have to make strokes from brushes. And the best way to do it is if you have a pen and a tablet, you know, with the mouse, when you do it, it feels less controllable, you know. At least for me, you know, I kind of feel more confident when I'm using a tablet. So the tablet with a pen allows you to kind of have more control over how you're sculpting something, as well as, you know, how much strength you're putting into it. So, you know, the tablet I currently have, it has pressure sens sensitivity. So yeah, like, you know, so you said that, you know, pressure doesn't work with mouse. That's why I kind of like tablets. So if I'm putting less pressure, you can see there's not as much strength that is being put. Sculpting something. So this kind of allows me to, you know, control how much clay I'm adding to something. So if I'm doing something really slight, this kind of, you know, allows me to control how much of a difference I'm making in terms of how much, you know, clay I'm adding to it. So, which is why I kind of like using a tablet. Another thing is, you know, ZBrush is actually specifically made for tablets. It would be really confusing to use it with a mouse. So everything that it has, every menus it has, you know, a tablet is a lot easier to use with it than something like a mouse. So for example, if you want to rotate around this object, the way you rotate is you actually, you know, keep your pointer away from the model in this empty space. And you can see there's a rotate icon. So you just click and move and it rotates. Using this with a mouse might make it really confusing, but with a tablet, it just, you know, just feels a lot easier to do so. And if you want to kind of move, you know, pan around, so if you hold Alt, you can actually pan around like this. So for any kind of movement, you have to do it outside your model in this empty space. So rotating with just, you know, normally clicking and moving. And if you hold Alt while doing the same thing, you can pan around. So this kind of allows you to adjust your, you know, where you're looking from. And with the tablet, it just makes it easy. Another thing is, you know, sometimes the way it moves, you might get lost or get confused as to where you are. So 
you know, to make things easy, you can actually snap at different angles. So if you hold shift and do the same kind of movement, you can snap at different angles. So I'm holding shift right now, and you can see I'm kind of snapping so like this or like that. And then I can move you know, here and just hold shift to snap back. So, you know, it's just, you can see right here also, there's a view of how this looks. You can actually click on it and move around at different angles, look from different places. This allows you to edit your model properly. You know, when I add some clay right here, I don't know what it looks like from a different angle. So it's, you know, it would be helpful if I look from a different angle and understand how it's changing the shape. Because, you know, even though we're working on a 3D model, the screen that we're using right now is a uh, display, you know, the display is 2D. So, you know, the best way to interact is to be able to move around an object and then look at how it looks like and then make changes. Now, in terms of sculpting, you know, of course, normal strokes, if if you're using a mouse, if you hold your left mouse button and try to sculpt something, then you kind of add that clay on top of it. And same with the pen, if you're just kind of drawing on top, it's kind of adding that clay. But if you want to do the opposite of this, so let's say you want to actually remove, you can hold Alt button and you can actually remove clay from it. So if you want to make a, you know, a hollow shape, you can actually do that. And then you can also see that, you know, it feels very weird on the face. Maybe you want to kind of smooth it out. Smoothing means, you know, kind of, blending these harsh edges to make it look you know, a lot more smooth than what it is. Then you can hold shift and then you can kind of sculpt from top and you'll see how you can see how it kind of smooths out any harsh edges and makes it easier to kind of see the shape. Of course, you know, smooth, you can try and use different kind of methods. So, you know, I smooth it a little bit. Maybe I can add a little bit more clay onto this part and then try to smooth it. And this also goes to the traditional methods of sculpting. You add or remove clay to, you know, adjust the shape of an object. So let's say this part needed to be a little bit more heavy. So I can try to add this on top. So maybe a little bit more of clay I can add. And then if I feel like I need to smooth it, then I can just hold shift and smooth. So now I have more volume on top. And now I'm blending it to make it look more natural. So this way you can you know, add or subtract clay from any of the surface. And this is actually the standard you know, brush. Standard brush just allows you to kind of you know, add or subtract clay from something. There's also other brushes that you can use to achieve the same thing. But before I talk about that, I also need to talk about, let me actually move this. Okay. So let me also talk about resolution. So like I mentioned, every model is built up of lines that are connected together to create this shape. So the less the lines, that means the more efficient it is, but also the less details it has. So you can see, when I turn, you know, with this button right here, I can toggle between the lines. And, you know, if I turn off the lines, you can still see that it has this weird lines that you can kind of look at. And that was it's a low resolution model. 
that means you know it has a set number of these faces sorry these points that are connecting these lines and the total number right now is around 12,972 points that are creating this shape. So usually with, you know, the more of these points, the more details it will have. So for example, if I click on geometry right here, yes, so tessellation is the technical term for this. So, you know, the more the points, the higher the detail. So right now you can see with less points, you will see, you'll notice that it has all of these lines and the changes you will make will also be limited to how much of this, you know, these points have. So for example, I just sculpted this and you can see it kind of create, it's creating this really harsh line right here like this. And that's because it doesn't have enough detail to have something look that it, that looks more smooth. Same with the nose, you can see the nose is, you know, if I zoom in, the nose is built up of these lines that are creating this curve, but it looks like it's, you know, it's, it's really sharp here, then it's sharp again right here, and then sharp again right here. If I had more points in the middle, it will look more smooth. So for example, if I click on this button right here, under geometry, which says higher res. And let's see. Actually, instead of that, I'm going to click on divide. So if I click on it, you will see it kind of divides it. Now, before it was around 12,972 points. After dividing it, it's around 52,000. 70 points and you can see now the difference that it makes now you can see it's a lot more smooth so yeah so dividing it is allowing it to be more smooth basically so this versus that you can see how round this feels now if i divide it even one more time you'll see now it's around you know 208,000 points and you can see now it's very smooth now you can see you can't even see any sharp edges at all maybe if you zoom in more at a point you will find any kind of sharp edges so let's see so you can see you know there's still those sharp edges but it's very minute that it's very much invisible to the eye that you know if you zoom out Let me adjust this. You know, if I if I zoom out, I will never notice those edges. Same with this area. Remember how the first version has these really sharp edges? If we you know subdivided, so the term for adding more edges is called subdivision. So the subdividing it is basically you know adding more edges in the middle. And you can see now it looks a lot more round. Before it was very sharp. And if I you know, add another division, it becomes really smooth. And if I add more, now it's around 830,000 points. And now it's so minute that you can't even notice any individual edges that were there. So for example, this one had with 830,000, you can't even notice any kind of different, you know, edge. So for example, right now my brush is really small. So if I sculpt something like this, you can see the effect that it looks like. If I did it, so I undoed it right now, and I'm going to do it on the second level, which is more detailed. Here, if I did that, you can see the difference. I'm actually able to make a smaller difference. Third one, you can see the difference in terms of detail that I'm able to add. And now if I do it in the fourth one, you can see how more detailed this looks. So this detail right here 
you know, you can see it looks like here's a round surface. If I go back to a lower version with the same detail, you can see how it looks like. And even lower, it kind of disappears. You can still kind of notice a little bit of it right there. And if I go to the first one, it feels like it didn't even exist. So that's the difference. So the lower this, you know, these points are, the less the detail will be, but also it will be efficient for the computer to calculate it. But then again, the more it is, the heavier it will be for the computer to calculate, but more. So you, you know, you can make these really small changes that you can never make with a lower version. So here you can never do that with a higher version you're able to create these details. So let me undo all of this. And a lot of times if you can't undo, you can smooth it out. And this kind of allows you to, you know, control the shape. The best way to sculpt something is to start from the bottom and then proceed further to the more higher levels. So for example, if I want to shape, you know, change the shape of this jaw here, if I try to sculpt something here, I mean, I still can for sure, but it would be a lot tough for me to achieve an accurate kind of shape. If I start from the very first, you know, very low version of it, it would be a lot easier for me to sculpt this and change the way it looks. And you know, once I'm done with that, if I move to the higher version, then you will see it looks a lot more you know, accurate. So it's very much like you know, in drawing, let's say you're making something that's a hard surface. I mean, you know, you start with something like a small blueprint of something. So you kind of, if you're making a, if you're drawing a face, how the face structure is, so make sure you're calculating the, you know, the distance of the eyes from the nose to make sure your, you know, composition, your proportions are accurate. So once you have the inline structure, then you start increasing your details. So you may, you know, you may start shading it a little bit. And then, you know, you will start increasing your details. You will actually start even smaller strokes of something like the, let's say the eyebrows. So it's just a layered system of how you make something. So you start from the bottom, which is the most efficient one. You make sure your shape is looking good. So let's say if I want to kind of edit this, I can try to you know, change things a little bit in it can try to maybe enlarge this part, make it more pronounced. And this also needs to be a little bit more pronounced. Maybe this needs to, you know, come out a little bit. So in the basic version find off what the shape should look like. I mean, of course, you should also smooth it a little bit to make sure it's not looking weird. And let's see. So now we can actually you know, discuss about more different brushes that allow us to kind of edit this. So if I click here, right, you know, of course, there's way too many brushes that I can discuss today but there's a lot of tools that you will actually hardly ever use because many of them are very specific to a certain scenario so for example you know there's tools that are for grooming so for hair or there's tools that are really specific that maybe you want to kind of you know polish something out or you want a very specific kind of texture to it so something like rake 
allows you to kind of actually let me switch to the higher version. So you can see how it's kind of adding this kind of, you might not want to use this, you know, depending on the situation, some of them are really specific that you might never want to use. Something like spiral. I mean, for making a face, you might never want to use it. But there's others that are really important and I personally use them almost every time. And this can also be very specific to the person and how they want to achieve a result. You know, everyone has their own ways to achieving something. I personally use this brush a lot called Clay Buildup. So if I click on it, this one is very much like the standard brush, but it is a lot more harsh. So for harsh, I mean, you can see it has this kind of texture. And this texture allows me to kind of, you know, you know, the muscle system of our body has some kind of texture. So these kind of lines allow me to understand the flow of those muscles. So for example, I know for a fact, this is how the eyebrows should flow. So this brush allows me to kind of understand that. So, you know, I can kind of try to smooth it. So once I'm, you know, I understand the shape of something, then I can start getting it out and then I can you know, realize how it looks. This also kind of adds randomness to everything. You can see after smoothing it out, it feels very natural. It doesn't look extremely smooth. You know, it has some kind of bumpiness to it. That's why I kind of like this brush. So let me smooth this out. Then there's, you know, the thing about build up, so it says clay build up, and there's another one called clay. So there's a difference between both. Clay is very much like standard brush, but you know, it adds a little bit of clay on top of it. But the thing about build up is if I keep adding it, see what happens. It just keeps adding clay to it. Of course, at a point, it can it starts to freak out because it's running out of how much, you know, how many edges that it can have. But you can see, you know, keep clay will kind of allows you more flexibility of how much clay you need to add. This kind of flexibility is what I like because this way I can shape things however I want pretty easily. So if I wanted something like this, you know, I can do, you know, I can make a shape like this and keep adding volume. And once I think it's looking fine, then I can just move it out. Of course, personally, I recommend if you want to make a really major change like this, it's better to do it in a lower version first and then you know move on to more details in the higher poly version. But still you can see how you know it makes it look more organic, it makes it look more natural. It kind of adds this kind of texture to everything, which is why I use clay build up a lot. There's more tools. Uh, I mean, it's tough to go through all of them for sure, but a few simple ones is there's something called move tool. And it's tough to sometimes find it, but there's a shortcut. So if I click on it right here and press M on the keyboard, it will highlight everything that starts from M. And then you will see a few letters next to all these brushes and that's you know, if, I pre if you press that particular button, that's, you know, that will select that particular tool. So for move, this is right here and it says V. So instead of clicking on it, I'm just going to press V and it will select that tool. Similarly, if you click on it and press C, you will see everything that has C in it. And there's a particular, particular you know, letter assigned to every all of these. So for clay build up, it says B, so I can just press B and now on clay build up. So it allows you to kind of quickly switch between tools. If you remember the, you know, the letters, it allows you to quickly switch. 
So again, I can click on it, press M and V. Now I have to move tool. Also, when you use a tool, it quick, you know, it it gets added to the quick pick. So you can see it says move, play build up. So now I can quickly switch between whatever I want. We also use rake, so it's right here. We also use spiral, and that's also here. So this way you can quickly switch between different tools. Brushes is the right word. No, because ZBrush calls tools like these models tools for some reason. But so now let me talk about what the move tool does. It actually allows you to select, you know, kind of select something and then move it slightly. So for example, if I want to move this, I can click on here and move it out. You can see it's kind of allowing me to move. Let's say if I wanted this nose to be moved out a little bit, I can do something like this and move things. It's very much like pull things, you know, in, in like real sculpting, you might want to pull something out and, you know, you would grab it and kind of move it out. So the move tool is very much like being able to grab and kind of pull things out. Of course, the way you're pulling in, you can also pull, you know, pulling out, you can pull things inside if you want. And if you hold the Alt button on something, this way you can actually move in and out from an object from its angle itself. So, you know, when I'm actually pulling things here, I'm pulling things according to the camera. But if you want to pull things exactly from the surface, you know, inside, then you can hold Alt and do it like this. And it's based on the camera. It's based on the surface itself and where the surface is facing. So for example, if I go on the nose and move it up, this is happening, right? If I hold Alt and move this up, it's moving outwards instead of up. So it's based on where the surface is facing. Then, you know, there's more tools. You can use things like flatten. This is to make things look more flat. You can see it's kind of trying to make the surface look more flat. If you hold Alt, I think it starts to make it look more round. So you can also use that if you want. And similarly, there's more, there's thing like polish. Polish also does something similar, which is where it tries to flatten things. It's more, you know, it works a little bit differently. You can see it's not making everything. If you're you know, scrubbing a surface to make it, you know, kind of polishing it. So that's what the brush itself is to polish something. And then there's something called dam standard. I mean, it's a weird word, but it allows you to kind of make these lines. So you can make strokes to kind of achieve more sharp lines. And of course you can also smooth it again to kind of, you know, cause it makes it really sharp. You can smooth it out. Of course, if you have a tablet, pressure sensitivity would allow you to kind of make smaller strokes. Or you can adjust the intensity. So I can try to decrease it from here. So I keep it really low. And now if I make a line, you can see it's really subtle. So this way you can make some really unique lines if you want. Of course, it's too low right now. I can increase it. And this way you can kind of add these minute details on a surface. Now again, I'm working on a really high version, which is 830,000 points. If I move back to the first one and try to make something, of course, it will not have that kind of detail, which a higher poly version will have.
So usually it's, you know, when I'm on a lower version, the tools I usually use is clay to kind of, you know, sculpt and add clay at parts. And then, you know, I can smooth it out, to create a shape if I want to. And then the other one I use is move because it allows me to adjust the shape, the overall shape of the surface. So again, if I'm on a higher version, if I try to move this down, you can see how it's moving it, right? If I'm on the lower version and I try to move it, you know, it, it feels a lot easier. It will make it a lot easier for you to move things. So if I want to make, move the whole jaw, I can move it down a lot easily versus if I was on the higher version. It just makes it easy. It might not be visible now, but there are certain scenarios where it's easier to do it you know, in the lower version. So like, you know, if I want to make really major changes to this face, you can see how the move tool allows me to kind of adjust the shape to make it look more unique. And you can see, you know, from different angles, move around. And if something looks weird, we can adjust to make it look more natural. And this way can kind of tweak the way this looks. Another thing which I, I think I didn't mention, because it already had symmetry on, so any change I'm making on this side will be reflected on the other side. So if you want to switch between, you know, if you want to switch between only making changes on, on this side, you can press X on the keyboard. And now if I make a change, it will not show on the other side. But for initial purposes, I usually always turn this on. And once I have something unique, I turn it off and then I try to adjust things to make it look natural. So, you know, there's no face that is ever symmetrical. There's all this difference. You know, everyone's face, if you hide one side of the face, the other side will look different. So this kind of randomness is something I usually add towards the end, but, you know, just to explain what how symmetry works, I can show you because a lot of people have really unique faces. And you can see this kind of face difference makes thing, things look a lot more realistic. Of course, it's, you know, something, it's better to add it towards the end because you're making a lot of different changes. And with symmetry, we are speeding up our process instead of trying to do things to twice for the face, we are doing it, you know, at the same time, and then we can implement those differences later on. So, you know, this way, using these different tools, there's a lot more tools that you can use, but, you know, it depends on how complicated you're getting into something. You know, it's better to kind of go through all of these, you know, and experimenting yourself and understanding what each tool does. And depending on how, what suits you, you might want to approach something differently. So everyone has a different way of doing something. So for example, this inflate brush, you know, you might want to, if you're trying to make this nose a little bit more thicker, one way is to use, let's say the standard brush Standard brush works like just adding clay onto something. The inflate brush, on the other hand, is right here. It kind of like, you know, like a balloon, it's inflating that part. So if I do this, you can see it's kind of inflating it. So depending on the situation, you might want to use different tools. And some people might not like this, they might want to use a different tool. 
you know, so it totally depends on personal preference as to how you want to approach and, you know, achieve a specific shape. So for example, for the eyes, I usually like inflate because it kind of adds that kind of thickness that I need. So depending on your preference, you might want to use a different brush. You know, from whatever, from whichever tool you're comfortable, it kind of dif you know, differentiates. So looking at the chat, it says snake hook. Yes, so yeah, the snake hook is also a really good one. So it's right here. This usually allows you to kind of pull things in a different way. I think it's better to show it in a higher poly version. So it's kind of also pulling things out, but in a snake way. So you can actually move things around and it will kind of create a unique pattern with it. So for example, I mean, it's more specific to creatures. You know, a lot of times if you've seen movies like Lord of the Rings or, you know, Harry Potter, they have creatures and creatures usually have different faces. You know, all of them are mythical creatures or a movie is shown, you know, trying to make something that doesn't exist in real life. You know, something that is not human, then tools like these are really helpful to make something really unique. You know, you can create different shapes. So snake hook is very much like moving something out and based on where you're moving, it will kind of extend this out. Of course, you know, the more you move out, the, you know, the more detail it requires to retain its shape. So that's something you have to keep in mind. Also, you can use this. So I think I used this for the crocodile where I was trying to make those, you know, those unique scales, or I think I was trying to make the teeth. So this kind of allows you to create that kind of shape. So yeah, like I said, there's tools for almost everything. Deco is also something which, you know, you can create different lines or patterns, I would say. So there's also different ways to move things. There's you no know, different ways to sharpen things. There's, I think, something called let me see. So yeah, there's different ways to smooth things out. There's something called pinch, which, which allows you to make you know something more sharp. So for example, this right here, if I want to make this a sharp line. Pinching is very much like, you know, you kind of more sharp. So this right here, if you can see, it's making it look more sharp. So yeah, there's different ways to approach different things. If, you know, I could also do the same thing with a clay build-up brush. I could subtract it, track, and then soften it. You can see now it becomes more sharp. Some people actually, you know, some people like this method. So a lot of really professional sculptors, instead of trying the pinch tool, they actually use this brush and do it manually because you can see how random it feels and they kind of need that randomness to make it look more realistic because faces are always random. So you know, having randomness makes that art feel which is why, you know, there's different ways of approaching the same thing. Other than that, I mean, there's still a lot of tools you might want to use. There's one more thing that, you know, that it can allow you to do something really unique. And that is, yes. So if you want, so I usually like clay build up. If you feel like it's, you know, very tough to use, I would recommend you should use the clay tool. So this one right here. So like, you know, the clay build up, you can keep building up clay on top. With just the clay, you can see a difference of when you do something like this. So multiple strokes, you can still build up if you want. 
but it is a lot more controlled as to how much clay you're adding. Because this right here, you can see how extreme this can get. But if you have a tablet, then with clay buildup, it's easier for you to kind of control how much clay you're adding. But if with a mouse and clay buildup, things might look like this. So I'm using a mouse right now. With clay buildup, this is what it looks like. With just the clay button and mouse, you can see it's a lot more controlled. So, yeah, so yeah, it would be easier for you to control the volume with just the clay button, uh, sorry, the clay brush. With clay build up though, if you have a tablet and you're used to it, then I would recommend, you know, once you're getting the hang of ZBrush, try clay build up. And this way you will be, you know, a lot more in control as to how you're creating something. About clay build up, which makes it look more unique. It adds that bumpiness that makes it look like it's real. You know, it's random because a lot of things in this world, of course, you know, it's an act of randomness. You will see trees, every tree is different in its shape. Every human face, there are similarities for sure, but you know, there's always differences. You know, some people might have different kinds of pores, the nose, some people might have thin nose or some people might have thicker nose. So it all depends on these differences and to that kind of difference and makes it look more unique. And these strokes just make it, you know, add this kind of texture that is easily readable. So you can understand the directionality of whatever you're doing. With clay buildup, it, it is less obvious and it's less harsh to understand the shape of the surface. So it all depends on personal preference. I would recommend start with the clay brush for sure. I mean, initially you should start with the standard brush itself is right here to get the hang of how scalp works and then move on to other brushes to achieve specific results. So another thing about undo, let me talk about is you can actually, you know, of course with brushes, you will be making multiple strokes and then to undo it, you will have to go back a lot. The good thing about ZBrushes, it's saving all of those strokes that you made. So you can keep undoing infinitely and you know you will be able to get back to a point where things you know were normal. So of course, keep pressing the button and it will take forever for you to find a point. As you can see right here, you know, which is very common in almost any kind of softwares. But if you are right here, just above this viewport, it has this orange line. And if I hover over it, it says undo history. So it's basically showing us all that history of how many strokes we've made or how many changes we've made to this. So if I click on it and scroll, you will see all the changes we have made so far. And it's pretty crazy that you know it saves almost everything that we've done to this model. And I can go to the starting point where we start from. If I make any change now, it will delete, it will ask you if you want to remove all those history because now you're making a different kind of change. So I can just hit cancel for now. If I want to move forward. I can again do that by scrolling. Just be sure it might be pretty heavy or it might take a little bit of time to calculate all of that. And it's just taking a little bit of time. Hopefully it doesn't crash though. And there it is. 
so let me talk about masking really quickly so yeah you can also use macro or you can also use what we call morph targets store a point of your model which you liked and then blend between different parts so for example if i go back So let's say this is the structure I like. And in this menu right here, if you scroll down, you will see something called morph target. And it, uh, you know, it allows you to kind of store, it says store empty, which means morph target. So if I click on it, it's basically saving this position right here. So now if I, if I start sculpting something, let's try making a major change. So move to, and let's do something like this. So now if I go into the brushes and you will find a brush called Morph right here. What this does is since we saved, we you know, saved something in the morph target. Now if I use this brush, it will actually blend towards that checkpoint where we saved it. So we'll try to remove anything that was you know after that point. So using a brush you can kind of blend towards back to that same shape that was there. So it kind of saves this shape right here. So macro is something I've never you know, used much, to be honest. So, you know, again, depends on how people usually approach something. I usually use morph targets or something like this. And now let me quickly talk about masking. So you can also make masks. For example, right now, if I make any changes, it will, you know, change anything that, that I'm kind of touching right now. So if I hold control on the keyboard, you will see it turns into this yellow circle and it says mask on it. So now if I draw, it's basically kind of, you know, adding this black color on top. And that's basically a mask. That means now if I try to sculpt, it will not allow me to sculpt in that area and it will kind of sculpt around that area. So anything that's not black will be move. So if you want to make the opposite, so a lot of times you only want to, you know, make just in that small area, you can just hold con control again and just tap on the side and now it flips the mask. So now you can actually sculpt in that area itself to make that change. So for example, if I want to do that on that and it will not affect anything that's outside. So this way you can kind of flip. So holding control and just tapping once on the side, you can flip between different masks. Sorry, flip the mask. And if you want to remove the mask, you just hold control again and just drag anywhere outside and then remove the mask. You can also mask things like this. You can hold control and drag just to mask a particular area. And then if you want to make changes, you can. So again, if I do something like this, you can see it's not going to affect the mask area. And this way you can make unique shapes for your surface. By the way, if anyone ha has any questions, you can keep asking. So yeah, uh, I can see mentioning, yeah, macro also saves the history. 
just a second. So yeah, macros also, you know, save history. I've never actually used it much, to be honest. So I'm not very knowledgeable about how macro works, but I think it allows you to save the history and still you can make change and come back to that position. So I personally use more targets for that, where I kind of like a particular shape and I just store it as more target. And then I can make you know, changes to it. And then if I want to kind of go to that position, I use the morph brush to blend between that. So, you know, using, again, using masking, you can make these unique shapes. For example, if I want to just work on the eye, eyebrows, I can just hold control and mask this area and just hold control and tap once to the side. And now I can only work in this area and this will not affect anything outside. And now if I again control and drag to remove mask, you can see now I have a scout for the eyebrows. And you can do this similar to you know any other parts if you want to kind of add some texture to this area. You know, you can work like this and add that kind of texture if you want. Again, I'm just quick doing it quickly without any you know proficiency. And once that's done. You can remove the mask and you only have texture on that area. So this way you can, you know, modify different things, like different parts. Uh, Manpreet, so, yeah? uh, I had one question while uh, you were doing the masking. Uh, I wanted to know mm -hmm. if like, you know, if uh, let's say, suppose I've done uh, like the lips just, just now you did, or you did the eyebrow. And uh, let's mm -hmm. say my I after I finished it, I want to again go back and do it. So can I get back the same mask or do I have to again redraw a mask? So there are ways uh, you can, I think you can kind of save the mask if you want. It depends on, you know, the, the way you save masks is pretty tough. You have to kind of turn it into a texture file and then you can import it as a mask. So there are ways you can save it, but you know, if you want to quickly do it, then there's not really a way to quickly, you know, go back to the mask. Okay. Uh, yeah, I if you want to, you know, yeah, I got that. So, I had another question also, uh, like, you know, right now, whatever you're doing, uh, like, let's say you're doing, mm -hmm. you've put that kind of a texture on to one side of the face and it automatically comes on the other side of the face. Let's say, suppose mm -hmm. if there is something that I want to do on only one, one eye or like, let's say only, you know, that uh, left chin or left, uh, as in, sorry, mm -hmm. left cheek. So uh, how do mm -hmm. I do that only on one part so it doesn't replicate yeah. the other? I so don't want it to press equal. X on the keyboard. All right. okay. So you can press X on the keyboard and that actually allows you to kind of turn off the symmetry. So, oh, so if, right. you know, if you can see there's a, you know, dot, which is following the same kind of, you know, location that I'm on yes. right now, Yes. Yes. press X, that will turn it off. And then you can kind of, you know, make oh, okay, chain okay. on one side oh. and that will not be reflected. Okay. This way you can kind of, you know, add more randomness. Mm -hmm. And I usually, you know, turn off symmetry towards the end when I have a lot of details already added. And then, you know, once I have all of that, then I kind of turn it off and then make those changes to the shape. Okay, okay, thank you, so, thank you. Yeah, um, so, you know, using these techniques and, you know, like I said, it's, it's very dependent on each person, everyone has different ways of achieving a particular result. And that's comes with practice, you know, the way you practice, or you, know, you might get comfortable with one brush that is easier for you than other brush. And a lot of times you also keep exploring. I personally, I don't know, you know, I know enough of ZBrush for whatever I want to make, but every time I open it, I learn something new myself because ZBrush has so much to offer, you know, it's very tough to kind of know everything about ZBrush itself. So, you know, I have a way that I usually follow for making my own models and, you know, then 
when I have something very specific, you know, a specific scenario which I'm trying to achieve and it's getting tough for me using the tools that I usually use, then I try to dive in and find more tools that make it easier. And those tools are very specific to, to those scenarios. And that might be something you might not use every day, but, you know, ZBrush does have all these different kinds of tools. So yes, so, you know, uh, ZBrush hasn't changed much, you know, in a while. It has been, you know, in terms of tools, like the brushes, it's very much the same. There's actually a few things, more things like it has dynamics now, so you can actually simulate cloth in this software. It works, you know, if you want to quickly make some cloth changes, but, you know, then it has things like layers. So now you can actually group things properly You know, you can have those things. The biggest change I've seen in ZBrush is to re-topologize. So, you know, right now the topology that something like this has, if you want to change it and make it more efficient, there's better ways to kind of remesh your surface and make it, you know, a lot more accurate. So the measure right here allows you to kind of quickly generate the structure by keeping the same kind of shape, but have it more efficient. And it has also has more tools, you know, that allow it to be easier for you to kind of send it to other softwares. So if you want to, you know, add more things on top of it, or you want to send it to Maya, it's a lot easier now. So, you know, the, the, menu and the tools are very much the same. The, the extra features that it now it has is what kind of, you know, allows you to make it easier for you to work with. So let me quickly look at the chat again. So yeah, uh, to create the mask, yeah, it's, you can quickly make it in Photoshop and you can project that here. That will be easier if you want to specifically save a mask. And yes, so ZBrush is really, really, you know, good with all of this. Like I said, you know, I, we have made all these changes. Of course, it, it's like around 830,000 points. So having all of these, these details and the really low version will look like this, which is weird, right? So ZBrush allows you to also kind of, you know, quickly recreate this new version of this shape. So this right here under geometry, if you go, says V Z measure. And this kind of allows you to change the structure of this. So to show this, I can turn this on. So this is what the structure looks like. You can see around the you know, all these scalps that we made right here. It's not following the same kind of circle. These edges are not following the direction of the circle. So if you use something like zero mesh, it will allow you to kind of add, implement that into the shape itself. So for example, I can turn on things like keep creases and detect edges. And now if I click on this button, it will take a little bit of time it will kind of solve the shape. It's not going to be perfect all the time. So a lot of times it requires manual work for you to kind of achieve a good result out of it. But for getting something quick, this is helpful. So now after this, you can see it's a lot more efficient now. And now these lines are following this round roundness that this shape has. This is where ZBrush is very good at making things more equal and you know, efficient. So you can use this technique to input. And you can also see this is around 13,000 active points. If I undo this, that was 833,000. And the result you get is, you know, 
if I turn off these lines, of course, you know, these are right here. But if I compare it to the other one, which was this right here, you can see it's looking a lot better now. So again, this versus the second. I think I removed it from the history, but I, I hope you got the point, right? So, okay, quickly again, uh, now let's, you know, see how we can actually, you know, have, of course, you know, you can use Z to measure and create a more efficient version of this, which kind of holds the shape, but it still keeps, you know, the efficiency in it. So let me quickly do that. And okay, right here. So now we can see, of course, you know, it's low poly, so you can build these lines, but now it also implements this in the shape, which was not there before. And based on this, you can now kind of export this out into a different software. So if you want, you can just quickly click on this export and you can export this into a different software and use it there. You know, there's also a lot of other aspects. You can actually color things on top. So right now there's no color added to it, but there is something called poly paint right here can see and if you click on colorize then it allows you to kind of paint a different color and right now it's not turned on so usually to paint you know if you use a brush for example if I use the standard brush you can see it's not painting anything and you know it's also changing the shape but what if I only wanted to paint then in that case, um, so, we can, so in that case, I can select the color and right here you can see these different options. So Z add means it is sculpting it. So if I click on it and if I do something here, it's not going to add anything now. That means it's not changing the shape, but now it's still not adding the color. So for that, we have this menu and right here it says, you know, all these different things. Material RGB means if I change this material to something else, it will paint that. Just RGB means just the color. So if I click on this now, now you can see I'm kind of painting color on top of it. So this way you can paint, you know, and add textures to something if you want. You know, I can keep changing this color, you know, add more variation to it if I want. You know, I can also change this to something else. And this way you can add more color to something. Of course, the more resolution again, the, the more detailed the coloring will also be. So this way you can kind of, you know, add coloring to something. Then in terms of materials, you can also change the material. So right now this is the default of gray texture to it. You can change it to something like poly skin and it will feel like more, more like a skin texture. I can change this to something like a wax or I can do something like a chrome ball or you know, reflective red or metal. this kind of allows you to change those materials. So now if I change this from RGB to MRGB, now I can also, you know, I can keep changing this to a different one. And let's say I paint it right here. Then I can change this to something else like a chrome and paint it right here. And now if I go back to the matcap gray, you will see that when I was on chrome and I painted it, this is what it looks like. It looks a lot more like chrome. This looks a lot more like skin. 
this is like the standard gray because we didn't use it with mrgb we only used rgb so this way you can also paint different materials on top if you want and yeah i mean this is just a face the face usually has the same kind of material for the overall skin but if in cases where you're modeling something else like a creature who has horns so you might want to make it more like a metallic horn or a more like a bone which is different from the skin then you have the option to kind of paint the material separately so of course you know all of these strokes that i've made are very much for tutorial purposes you know i wanted to show what brushes do and how you can achieve different things you know i didn't really focus on achieving a face i just focused on trying to show you what these tools do but once you have something more solid you know then it looks a lot you know better because you're more focused you know it's better to have references of whatever you're modeling and that will allow you to kind of achieve something easily so let me see if i can find an example i think So I actually did one session of digital sculpting before where I created the face of Morgan Freeman. If Morgan Freeman is a really famous Hollywood actor and I didn't complete this. I basically used references for this project. So let me open it. And I can also show you what Morgan Freeman looks like. So Morgan Freeman, you might recognize him from his face. He has a really unique voice as well as really unique acting skill. And I tried to attempt to recreate his face. And this is what I have. So basically, you know, this was created from, by using references. So it's always important, but if you're making a real person, you will need to look at their face side by side and compare it and kind of capture the same kind of structure that they have. This was created with symmetry, so most of it is symmetrical. But once you have, you know, changes done, then you can start adding those differences. And of course, this was not complete. I didn't work on the ears. I didn't work on the eyes properly. I did add some details just to show, you know, a little bit of pores up. And this is, so the low poly version looks something like this. You can see how it looks. If I increase it, the more I increase, the more the quality increases. And the highest quality will always have more details. And you can see this version now, pores of the skin and you know a combination of the all these tools is what allowed me to kind of make this and again this is not complete there's other versions you know there's other projects that are more complete than this but this is something i wanted to show just to you know give a tutorial of what can be achieved by using these tools so okay I think we only have five minutes left and, you know, hopefully sir. everyone. Yes, sir. We have five minutes. Hand. Yeah. So, yeah, I, in these five minutes, I would, you know, I would like everyone who has any questions to ask. So, you know, hopefully everyone was able to follow everything properly. Anyone who has any questions? Dear participants, do you have any questions? 
Dear participants, do you have any questions? From my side, no. Sir, uh, this is Rini yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, it was a really uh, nice demonstration. Uh, really loved the way you were doing it. And uh, uh, I was very intrigued by the fact that, you know, uh, I am not, a, you know, a modeler or, um, you know, a Maya user to be uh, like. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm, I'm interested in, uh, you know, in sketching and drawing and I do that. I'm, I'm more of a 2D artist which I do mm -hmm. more on paper, pen, pen and paper or pencil and paper, mm -hmm. any other medium. Uh, I've also been trying my hands with Photoshop and all that. So uh, I do a little bit of digital painting also as Gokul sir mm -hmm. and Ankan sir was also speaking earlier. So as a 2D artist, uh, I am not interested in the 3D modeling of it. Do you recommend that? But I'm, I'm, I was quite uh, interested in the way you were doing it. And, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that's where even I thought that maybe could that be like, can I pick up my skills upon this? I would be interested to do this, but not the modeling part, just the sculpting yeah. part, you know, just getting those so textures would, and yeah. I would say definitely uh, there's a lot of scenarios, you know, a lot of sculptors actually don't know anything about modeling. Mm -hmm. So it is something which, you know, like I, I've no, I know a lot of people who don't like the technical side of things or, yeah. you know, they, they are wonderful sculptors. So, uh, so at that, uh, yeah. so you do recommend me that uh, if interested, I could go in only for a Z ZBrush or you know learning up the software. Yeah, without definitely. without without knowing three uh, D modeling also is all right. Yeah, definitely. I, I would say you know if you like drawing yeah. and you like painting, you know this is a really good software for you to express your you know creativity and you know it's it just kind of you know the same principles that you use for drawing and painting will you know, be able you you'll be able to you know apply them here in the software so you don't necessarily need to learn modeling you know the thing about this is uh, a lot of people also use this for just illustrations so okay. a lot of concept artists or a lot of you know people who paint they actually mm -hmm use this medium for making their paintings or their illustrations. So if you want, you can also, you know. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. I would totally recommend you to use it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who has any questions or would like to, you know, express their thoughts? Dear participants, do you have any questions? Okay, uh, sir, uh, it was in good sessions and great sessions for all of us. And uh, we have learned so many things. So thank you so much. Thank you once again, sir. We can end up the session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone had a great time. And hopefully I'll get the chance to meet all of you again. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.